HMAS Sydney berths in Vung Tau Harbour, bringing another shipload of diggers for 12 months duty in Vietnam. After 12 more or less relaxing days aboard the troop carrier, the moment of expectancy arrives. Laden with combat and personal gear, the diggers move onto the flight deck to await their next means of transport, which will take them to their base 20 miles away at Nui Dat. It's the giant United States Army Chinook helicopter, and the downdraft from the huge rotors nearly blows them off the flight deck. They watch veterans of another unit alighting first. They're going home, suitcases and all. They've completed their 12 months. It's the new diggers' turn now. The Chinooks carry 33 fully equipped soldiers, about the same as you'd put in a suburban bus back home. Operation Airlift will be completed in about two hours. The next time they see HMAS Sydney will be in another 12 months from now, when they head for home again. Their first glimpse of the country is a fishing village on the Vung Tau Peninsula. From now on, operations will take them through a wide variety of terrain, from the thick jungle of rainforests to open paddy fields and villages. Within minutes, they're over Luscombe Airfield, the medium airstrip serving the task force at Nui Dat. This strip was built by Australian Army engineers when the task force moved from Bien Hoa in 1965. Once on the ground, the new arrivals find themselves face to face with some of the trying conditions they'll have to live with in Vietnam. The hot sun and the fine red dust. But their new quarters are under canvas, protected by the rubber trees of an old French plantation. After undergoing a familiarization period, the diggers are ready for their first operation. The tremendous mobility of the helicopter provides the Allies with one of their most versatile weapons in Vietnam. Whole formations can be lifted into or out of enemy territory within minutes. Each man has only seconds to board his aircraft. The RAAF Iroquois squadron flies most of the operational airlifts for the diggers, but the United States Army choppers frequently supplement them on big missions. Whenever possible, the pilots fly higher than 1,500 feet to avoid small arms ground fire. This height also gives the soldier a good view of the type of country he's going to move through on foot. Nearing the landing zone, the helicopters fly much lower to catch the enemy unawares. At 110 miles an hour, the Viet Cong have little time to aim before the chopper flashes past. On the ground, the lessons learned over months of training come as second nature. Troops quickly take up defensive positions to protect the landing zone against enemy attack. Successive waves of choppers fly overhead, giving added protection as the troops move off.
the commanding officer verifies his position and issues final instructions to a company commander. Should contact be made, the resupply of ammunition, rations and other essential supplies will be needed fast. Detailed planning of the operation ensures no delays. However, each soldier is prepared to support himself in the jungle and carries up to five days rations on his back. Orders issued, the troops move off. Dense bush, tangled vines, bamboo. These are just some of the hazards the digger in Vietnam has to contend with. Moving through swampy paddy fields brings a particular set of dangers, with the discomfort of hours or even days of wet feet and sodden clothing, leeches, ticks and clinging mud. Tension is always high during operations, but once on the move, physical problems outweigh the mental strain. The humidity is high, and it's always hot. It isn't easy moving through this jungle. The thick, tangled undergrowth might give some protection from the sun, but it also reduces visibility. This is Viet Cong territory, and Charlie may not be far away. Each man knows it's only by close team effort that results will be achieved. There could be a contact ahead. The forward scouts have signaled caution. It's a contact, all right. Time now to reenact the well-rehearsed drills coordinating rifle and machine gun groups. After a short, sharp engagement, the enemy decides to break contact. A digger is wounded, but a medic is quickly on the scene. A short trek to the nearest jungle clearing and he'll be on his way for expert medical attention. This contact was valuable. Not all the Viet Cong got away. Documents and equipment are captured. Viet Cong regular soldiers are well armed and equipped. Their lightweight clothing and rations ensure mobility and elusiveness. They carry ample ammunition. A prisoner is brought in for questioning. He provides information which may well prove accurate. A Vietnamese interpreter translates for the commander. The prisoner hints of an enemy base camp nearby. This lead will be followed up. Plans for the search are quickly made. Other battalion elements are alerted that a search has begun. This time the prisoner's information proved correct and the patrol locates a Viet Cong hideout.
the troops discover a primitive rice mill. And then, a useful rice hoard. The rice is bagged, ready for transport to the task force base. It's earmarked for distribution to needy villagers through the Army's civil affairs team. Roads in the area don't exist, and RAAF helicopters are flown in to airlift the valuable find. The Viet Cong obtain rice supplies from two main sources. They steal it from villagers at harvest time, or use their own labourers to grow it. But their own attempts at farming usually end in failure, as they become easy targets for airstrikes and artillery bombardment. These camps are often riddled with bunkers and escape tunnels, which must be destroyed. The explosive experts of the assault pioneer platoon carry out their task and prepare the charges. Similar bases of varying size are scattered throughout Phuc Thuy. Some tunnels are dug to three levels with interconnecting passages. The VC tunnel complexes, which took months to build, are destroyed in seconds. Planes of the Australian Army Aviation Corps support the troops continuously. Sioux helicopters and Cessna aircraft of the reconnaissance flight provide the commanding officer with up-to-the-minute information on Viet Cong activity and movement of enemy troops. Vital information on an enemy supply route spotted from the air enables deployment of men in readiness for attack. From within a concealed command post, the nerve centre for operations, the commander plans his next move. Units located throughout the area are alerted by radio. From here, gunners of the Australian Field Regiment, constantly in support of the infantry, are fully briefed. The gunner command post exercises a tight control over the gun lines to ensure accurate artillery fire support. Safety problems are resolved, and at the gun site, absolute accuracy of plotting and ranging is continually checked. For the gunners operating the 105 mm howitzers, it's a most exacting task, as fire support is required 24 hours a day. Standby gun detachments are on duty all the time. Gunners operate both pack and towed howitzers in all classes of terrain. While the gunners may be based some miles away, the infantry's own 81mm mortars are closer at hand, providing additional fire support. Also in close support of the infantry are the 50-ton Centurion tanks. Their 20-pounder guns range up to five miles. The Centurions greatly assist the infantry movement through enemy minefields and give them closer firepower from a mobile gun base. The broad Song Rai River twists for miles through the mangroves, rice paddies and jungle stretches of an important VC haven in Phuc Thuy province. Diggers use light aluminium power boats to search along the river, which the Viet Cong use as a supply route inland. American B-52s have bombed this area continuously to destroy sampans and base camps. Retreating enemy are forced to leave their river boats, which the diggers seize and tow away for destruction. Telltale signs on the river bank indicate tracks, perhaps to a Viet Cong base. The patrol finds the area laid waste with shattered trees and vegetation. And huge bomb craters help to explain the absence of VC resistance.
but enemy camps are still found along the river banks. Fishing nets and other equipment are destroyed on the spot. The Viet Cong use this equipment to provide a valuable source of food. It must be destroyed before moving on. Sharp, protruding mangrove roots can pierce a foot or a leg as efficiently as a Viet Cong panji stake. They protrude through the mud or lay hidden beneath its surface. The stench of the slimy, clinging mud may last for days. It gets into your boots and clothing and can turn a cut septic if not treated quickly. The diggers are well versed in methods of crossing natural obstacles. Basic techniques learnt at the Jungle Training Centre at Kanungra prove valuable and there's plenty of scope for their practical application. Ropes help make the going a little easier but with some obstacles there's just no easy way. Reflexes must be automatic as a slip on a submerged obstacle can cause a sprained ankle or other injury which may slow down the platoon and put other mates in danger. Teamwork comes into every phase of patrolling. When fording swiftly flowing waterways, the pioneer platoon sets up ropes across the river to help the heavily laden diggers over the more difficult parts. The 60 or 70 pounds of gear carried by soldiers on operations, together with their weapons, adds to their discomfort. The 20 to 30 operations they'll carry out in 12 months will take the diggers through every section of Phuc province including the populated areas near the coast. In open terrain, armoured personnel carriers, nicknamed tracks, assist in patrolling and make this phase a lot easier. The beach provides a convenient rendezvous point for troops to join the M113s, and it's a nice feeling to get the equipment off your back for a while. The soldiers find the ride a welcome change from walking. On an open stretch, the tracks are capable of 40 miles an hour. 30 and 50 millimeter caliber guns protrude from turrets ready for instant action. The versatile carriers operate in all types of terrain, from beaches and sand dunes to the densest jungle and swamps. Their role in this operation is to carry the diggers into their position for a cordon and search of a village suspected of harboring Viet Cong. The sophisticated communications equipment they carry provides an alternative, reliable link for the infantry and operational headquarters. On nearing the village, but still out of earshot, the tracks pull in and the troop commander radios headquarters that the next phase is to begin. From here in, the diggers move on foot and they saddle up. Search parties enter the village along well-worn tracks to eliminate the possibility of casualties from enemy booby traps. For many of the young Australians, this is a new experience. People of the village readily cooperate, but the diggers search carefully for hidden weapons and escape tunnels. Most of the Vietnamese wait at home during the search, identity cards handy. Lightning searches of villages are conducted regularly throughout the province, and these may take hours, even a day, to complete. Suspects are detained and taken to company headquarters for questioning.
a Vietnamese interpreter works with the soldiers during operations and questions the suspects. Those detained are handed over to Vietnamese civil authorities for interrogation. It's surprising to find a young man. They're usually serving with government forces, or perhaps with the Viet Cong. Interrogation is a slow process. On the lighter side, a pretty little village lass relieves the tension of the search as she peddles her wares. And she makes a sale. Vietnamese youngsters react in much the same way as children the world over. Fish and rice are the two staple foods in Vietnam. And Phuc Thuy is one of the main fish producing areas. Dried fish is considered a delicacy. And fishermen's families process much of the catch by drying it in the sun. Fishing villages receive intensive searching, as the Viet Cong use them frequently as bases for staging troops in transit. Many fishermen operate motorized sandpans, but these too are highly suspect, as they are a means of transporting Viet Cong, as well as bringing in a haul of fish. The tedious business of questioning and searching goes on. Once a village has been cleared, troops commence one of the most important tasks, helping the sick and needy. Mobile clinics are set up, and army doctors and their assistants begin treatment. For many, it's their first proper medical care for years. Most illnesses are caused through the lack of a balanced diet and neglect of childhood health. An army dentist is also with the team. Whole families line up to be examined. Leaving the civil aid team to do their work, the diggers move out from the village. Aggressive patrolling gives the enemy little time to set up new bases effectively. Often, the Viet Cong have minutes only to scatter before a patrol finds their camp. Firewood and partly completed bunkers are giveaway signs that they made a hasty retreat. Probing is extensive. Obviously a fortified and well-established position. Prompt reporting could enable the diggers to ambush the fleeing Viet Cong. Surprise is the keynote if the enemy is to walk into an ambush. Following the well-rehearsed drills of their training, the soldiers take positions. Then follows the most tedious part of an ambush, the waiting. It's now that your stomach turns over. Is everything ready? Cease fire. Suddenly there's an unnatural quietness. A wounded Viet Cong gives himself up, but no chances are taken. The Viet Cong know the drill when they surrender, and the prisoner is tied up. A quick search might reveal vital clues and save soldier lives. The prisoner could be carrying valuable information. If he's wounded, 
he's given medical treatment. After months of jungle hardship, it could be a relief to be captured. For him, the fighting is all over. A successful ambush and search of prisoners and bodies may save weeks of patrolling if enemy plans are uncovered. Viet Cong soldiers often feign death, but suddenly spring to life when they realize it's all up. Many prisoners captured are very young. Some are only in their teens, but they're old enough to fight tenaciously. As this wounded digger can testify, The follow-up to a successful ambush may take some time. The Viet Cong regular is no fly-by-night guerrilla. He's dedicated and well-trained. Each item recovered from his equipment is carefully checked and documented before being sent to headquarters. So much for that. But where to from here? This one didn't make it either. For him, it's over. But for the diggers, it's business as usual. And so it is that the elusive Viet Cong have again evaded the patrol despite all care and planning. His discretion to melt away, to ambush, to harass, to kill. Another way, another day. The diggers reach the beach ready for yet another switch and another change of transport. In this, the complex and ever-changing environment of a strange war. This time, it's by an Australian Army landing ship. Refreshing surf is a pleasant change after the enervating and rigorous conditions endured during the task of the past few days. Troops and tracks alike wade out and up the ramp, ready for the trip back to base. the end of another day. For more than 7,000 Australian troops serving in Vietnam, this is just part of the lives of some of them. It's a difficult job in an unusual country. When they return to base, they'll talk over their experiences with their mates, just as their fathers did in wars gone by, the things they did, the places they've seen. These are the diggers of Vietnam. Such their task these their weapons, this the country in which they fight. For them the endless patrols, the river crossings, the searching, the tensions, the sweat and toil will all prevail until they too return home, their mission complete.